and welcome back to Voyage of a Time Wanderer. Today I want to share my top five fiction reads from 2020. So I had a pretty great reading year in 2020, I had a lot of free time on my hands, and I read just over a hundred books, which is a record for me since I started keeping track of my reading on Goodreads, and probably a record uh, since my early teens when I was reading a lot before school got more involved. So I'm very happy to have read uh, more than a hundred books, but it definitely made it hard to choose uh, my favorites, but I managed to whittle it down to my five favorite books from 2020 with one honorable mention, and I have ranked them, so I'll start with the honorable mention and then go up from number five to my top favorite book from last year. So. The honorable mention I have, I chose as an honorable mention because it is one of the books that has stuck with me the most, but it is, I think, self-published on Amazon, and it's a collection of poetry and short fiction. So it doesn't really fit into uh, a traditional ranking, but it's one that I enjoyed so much that I had to mention, and that is It Begins in a Garden by Sarah N. B. And Sarah N.B. is someone whose blog I had followed for a long time, and I finally got around to picking up uh, this self-published poetry collection, which is a collection of uh, poetry and short fiction focused on uh, religious themes. So the first section is all inspired by Genesis and the creation narrative. The middle section is dealing with the Gospels and uh, poetry and fiction inspired by Jesus. And then the third section is all dealing with angels and heaven. It's a very unique uh, take on religious writing, um, but it manages to stay reverent while exploring themes in a very creative uh, way. So if you're interested in religious themes in writing, I highly recommend It Begins in a Garden. Then at number five, I have As Bright as Heaven by Susan Misner. And this is a book that was kind of making the rounds everywhere because it is um, dealing with the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Even though it was written a few years ago before we found ourselves in our current situation here in the world, it had a bit of a resurgence, I think, in the book community as people were looking for pandemic related fiction. And this is just a beautiful story. I believe it's set in Philadelphia, so in a big city, and it was just fascinating to read a fictional account about uh, the Spanish flu pandemic and see all the similarities to um, the situations that we have been in throughout 2020, uh, reading about school closures and masks and trying to distance on public transport. Both eye-opening and reassuring, I guess, to see what humanity has survived in the past and how similar it is to our current uh, situation. And this book follows a family, a mother and father and three sisters, and they move into the city at the beginning of the novel to live with uh, their father's uncle, who works as an undertaker. And he has no children of his own, and so he's chosen the father of the family to inherit his family business. And so they move to the big city from a small uh, farming community and at the beginning, you know, they think that's going to be the adventure, moving to a big city, learning uh, the trade of being an un undertaker, and then obviously the flu pandemic hits, and um, being working as an undertaker during a flu pandemic is obviously an overwhelming uh, task, and it sweeps the whole family up in the drama of it all, and of course uh, they cannot escape unscathed. They find a little baby boy who has been orphaned uh, by the pandemic, and the book kind of follows through them fostering this baby, how the family and the people in their community, their neighbors are affected by the flu pandemic. And then we skip forward about 10 or 15 years into the future. Uh, and that's the second part of the book dealing with these girls growing up and how the ramifications and impact of the events of the Spanish flu pandemic are still impacting them in their young adult years. So it was a really moving read and we really got into the heads of each of the characters. It was written from a multi-perspective uh, narrative where each chapter was coming from the perspective of a different sister. And so I'm definitely interested in picking up more of Susan Missner. I think she has a real gift for uh, bringing historical fiction to life. And at number four we have Bleak House by Charles Dickens. This is one of two Dickens that actually ended up on my top five this year. So spoilers for one of the top three books, it's also a Dickens. I finished Bleak House in January of this year and I had been listening to the audiobook for quite a while so it did feel like quite an accomplishment uh, to wrap it up but Bleak House was just an incredible, an incredible story. At the time I thought it was my favourite Dickens 
Obviously, spoilers, it isn't, <laughs> because there's another Dickens higher up on this list. But Bleak House is such a sweeping tale. It, at the beginning of the story, we're introduced to three teenagers, and they are all connected um, through a legal case, John Dice and John Dice, that has been going through the court system for decades, and has kind of gotten uh, wrapped up in various uh, legal red tape. And all three of these children are implicated in some way in the case, and one of them has been brought in to be a companion uh, for the other two, who are being taken to a distant relation's house to be raised. So these two cousins and then their companion are the three main characters that we follow throughout the story, and we see how uh, issues of wealth and inheritance and living, living for the future rather than for today uh, impact their lives as they grow up. I don't want to spoil anything so I won't go into more depth, but it is inc an incredibly rich story and I definitely got emotionally invested in each of the characters and their lives and the mistakes they were making and uh, the paths they were trying to follow for the future. It was a book with a lot of twists and turns that kept me on my toes and I highly recommend it if you haven't got around to it or if you're intimidated by it because it is one of Dickens longer works. It's definitely well worth the, the time. Then at number three, we have Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. And this is one that I actually listened to on audiobook just in December. And I listened to the movie tie-in edition with Kenneth Branagh uh, narrating it. So he plays Hercule Poirot in the latest movie adaptation. And he did an excellent job narrating. He really captured the different characters, accents, and mannerisms so that it really brought the book to life for me. This is one that kept me up at night because I couldn't go to sleep until I knew what had happened. I stayed up way too late listening to it and it was just a brilliantly written mystery novel. I had managed to avoid spoilers so I was completely taken by surprise at the end and uh, the atmosphere of a train ride in the middle of a blizzard was just perfect for December and it's one that I don't think I'll forget anytime soon. I'm really hoping that when they release uh, the Death Death on the Nile movie in 2021 that they'll also do a movie tie-in audiobook with uh, Kenneth Branagh uh, narrating again because I really would love to listen to all of Christie's books narrated by him. So Then at number two we have our second Dickens and that is A Tale of Two Cities which I read during Victober this year, and if you watch my Victober wrap-up you know I was completely enchanted by this book. It totally surprised me as I wasn't really expecting to love the storyline. I haven't read a lot of uh, French literature or French Revolution literature, so it wasn't a time period that I was particularly interested in going into the book, but it was one of the shorter Dickens, and after finishing Bleak House I just wanted a shorter Dickens that I could um, power through in the month. And I tore through A Tale of Two Cities in just a few days listening to the audiobook. It, the story absolutely swept me up. I felt like I was there. It helped having seen a lot of the places in Paris when I was visiting uh, earlier this year so I could picture a lot of it, but it's just a brilliant story. It follows a family that has complicated ties between France and the UK, and as they travel back and forth between the two countries, and when they eventually get trapped in France during uh, the revolution, their various alliances and family history uh, complicate the plot immensely. The cast of characters is very nuanced and I could empathize with people on both sides of the narrative and I really feel like A Tale of Two Cities is Dickens at his best. Then we've arrived at my favorite book is one that I listened to on audiobook in January and nothing I read since could unseat it and that is Station Eleven by Emily St. Jean Mandel. I listened to this, like I said, on audiobook in the space of about 24 hours while I was flying to Kenya on what I didn't know at the time would be my last business trip. And it was right at the beginning of COVID-19, so there was starting to be some posters up in airports and some temperature screening at various points along my journey, but it wasn't at the point where it was uh, totally uh, all-encompassing of global events. So I'm glad I read Station Eleven when I did because I feel like if I'd tried to read it in like March or April it might have been a little bit too scary, but having read it in January I, I felt like I couldn't help but tie events in throughout the year uh, into Station Eleven and I'd see something on the news or be living through something and be like, oh my goodness, this is just like what happened in Station Eleven. So I'm very happy that I read it in January. It did feel like it set the stage for the year. <laughs> 
and it's just a brilliant piece of pandemic literature. It it has both a multi-character and multi-time period uh, narrative, so we're skipping back and forth um, between before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic, as well as moving from a variety of characters' perspectives. Uh, one of the primary um, narrators is a young woman who is involved with a traveling Shakespeare troupe who are traveling um, from community to community in the post-pandemic world, um, keeping the arts alive and, and doing community Shakespeare plays uh, when they arrive at a new community. And it definitely, when I was reading it, it just brought to life how many little day-to-day -day things I don't even think about that are really quite incredible and that I'm fortunate uh, to have. And then obviously, as we moved throughout the year, it only became more and more relevant. And Station Eleven is a book that has just lived in my mind throughout the year since I read it in January. Probably hardly a week goes by that I don't think about it or think about uh, some of the events in it. So highly recommend if you haven't read it. Uh, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel is definitely going to be the defining book of 2020 for me. So those are my top five uh, fiction reads from 2020 and I will also be posting a video with my top five nonfiction reads so check that out if you haven't seen that video yet. Until next time, enjoy wandering through the pages of a good book. Bye!